I'm Harriet Vance Ball, cardiologist and clinical trialist, and I'm delighted to have with me Luke Laffin from the Cleveland Clinic. We are here at ACC 2025 to discuss his late breaking clinical trial presentation, Advanced Hypertension. Welcome, Luke. Hey, great. Thanks for having me. So tell us some of the context that guided your research question. What problem were you trying to solve and how did you go about it? Well, it's a big problem. As you know, hypertension is rampant um, in North America and really throughout the world, um, particularly uncontrolled hypertension. And so looking at new mechanisms by which uh, drugs can lower blood pressure, this specifically looked at a new class of blood pressure lowering drugs called aldosterone synthase inhibitors, and specifically the drug lorundrostat. Um, rather than blocking the mineralocorticoid receptor like spironolactone or plurinone, what these, this class of drugs does is al disrupt aldosterone biosynthesis, and so decreases aldosterone levels, and theoretically decreases blood pressure. Okay, so why might it be a, a preferred alternative to something that's already available and in use? What could it potentially afford that an MRA couldn't? Well, I think that we have to go back to a little bit of data, particularly from the primary aldosteronism literature. And so those individuals who um, have proven primary aldosteronism and they get adrenalectomy compared with those that get treatment with a plurinone or spironolactone, the ones that get adrenalectomy do better. Okay, they have less AFib, less heart failure, really better from a cardiometabolic perspective. Um, and so that's thought to be due to the circulating aldosterone. Like when you're, you know, when you're blocking the MR, you still have circulating aldosterone. So are there effects of aldosterone that are mediated uh, not through the mineralocorticoid receptor, really? And those are called so-called non-genomic effects. And so theoretically, an aldosterone synthase inhibitor could be more beneficial than an MRA. Okay, so this was a dose finding trial. Tell us your primary aims and the doses that you tested. Yeah, sure. So actually, the dose finding trial was published back in September of 2023. What this was one of its pivotal trials of Lorendrostat. So it looked at um, placebo compared with 50 milligrams of Lorendrostat daily for 12 weeks or a strategy of dose titration. So you got 50 mil, one group was randomized to lorundrostat 50 milligrams for four weeks, and then could potentially increase to a hundred milligram daily dose if blood pressure remained uncontrolled at four weeks. So it was really one to one to one randomization. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about your trial design and the different phases of the clinical trial. Sure. And so there's there's a few key features for this to mention. Um, number one was it was performed in patients that were taking between two and five blood pressure medicines at baseline. Their office blood pressure needed to either be between 140 and 180 systolic or between 90 and 110 diastolic. And if they met those criteria, along with a couple other biomarker criteria, they were then placed on a standardized antihypertensive regimen to really get people on an ideal regimen. So those individuals that came in on two background blood pressure medicines were switched to Olmosartan 40 milligrams plus indapamide 2.5 milligrams or hydrochlorothiazide 25, so a diuretic and an ARB. And those patients that entered on between three and five medicines, they also received amlodipine as part of the standardized regimen. They took that for three weeks along with a single blind placebo for lorundrostat, the drug. And then once they'd been on that for three weeks, they had the gold standard for blood pressure measurement, which is 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure measurement performed. If blood pressure remained uncontrolled, still on that, that standardized, really optimized regimen, shall we say, then they entered the 12 week treatment period where they got either placebo, lorundrostat 50, or lorundrostat 50 to 100 milligrams in that titration strategy we discussed um, for 12 weeks. And then following that, there was a, a four week washout period. And the primary endpoint was change in blood pressure compared with placebo in each of the respective lorundrostat groups at the 12 week mark. Okay, um, so that's interesting. And, and what, why, why did you do that run-in period? Was it just to standardize the therapies and put people on I ideal combination therapies or? Yeah, it was really to rule out sort of pseudo-resistant hypertension, right? We know that certain things like out-of-office blood pressures um, 
uh, you know, need to be measured in these individuals. And so that's why we did 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. We also know that if you look at quote unquote, usual care for hypertension, it's quite poor. Okay. Um, people coming in on 50 of low sartan and, you know, 12 and a half of hydrochlorothiazide, um, that's not going to get anyone <laughs> to goal, right? Um, and if you look, the predicate studies um, for, for different blood pressure lowering medicines or even technologies like renal denervation, um, that was one of the things that, that they did as well, where they put patients on this standardized regimen. We doubt the people that don't necessarily need a new, you know, fancy therapy. They just need good old tried and true generic medicines, but the patients that truly would benefit from this therapy. And one of the, one of the important features that we found with this trial um, is, is that really ultimately led us to a large population of, um, of black patients. So African-American patients, because it was performed predominantly, it, all the sites were in the U S um, because they have a, that, group of patients tends to have a higher burden of resistant hypertension, which we were really trying to focus on, finding those truly resistant hypertension folks. Sure. So give us a rundown of the trial flow, uh, the proportion of patients that passed, surpassed that run-in phase and were actually randomized, just to have a sense of the proportion of patients with resistant hypertension who would have been offered this therapy? Yeah. So there was just over 2,600 participants or patients that were screened for the trial. 926 of those ultimately were placed on the standardized regimen. And of those 926, 285 were randomized. Um, and so they, you know, there's a pretty significant delta there, you know, just under about between six and 700 participants. And of those individuals, 53% of those, about 641, who did not qualify for good getting to randomization because their blood pressure was too low. Um, and that's in line with, with other studies as well. So we have good medicines for the majority of hypertension, but for those individuals that need additional therapies, um, that's really important. One thing that I can highlight is that you know, at the start of the trial, at before they were placed on the background therapy, the blood pressure was about 155 on average systolic. We put them on therapy and the, the mean, that's of the randomized participants. The mean blood pressure um, at the time of randomization was about 140, 141. So we dropped them 15 points in just three weeks by putting them on that standardized regimen, which is, you know, important to know. Tell us about the baseline characteristics of your patients. So the average age was about 60 years of age. There was 40% women enrolled. As I alluded to earlier, 53% uh, uh, black race um, patients were in the study as well. Um, the average GFR at randomization was right around 75 or so when you calculate it using serum creatinine. Um, the average BMI was in the, about the 31 range as well. Um, and so these were patients that were, you know, sort of our typical patients that we would see in clinic with uncontrolled hypertension, right? Amongst the randomized patients, more patients were on two drugs coming in rather than three to five. Um, it was about 60% on two drugs, about 40% on, on three to five drugs coming in um, when we think about then putting them on the standardized regimen. But those are really the, the baseline characteristics. Right. And because it's a small um, trial overall with a small number of patients in each group, I have to ask you about comorbidities, um, metabolic indices, and co-therapies. Were they balanced between the groups? They were. I mean, there was a little bit more diabetes in the uh, Lorundrostat 50 to 100 milligram arm, um, but generally they were well balanced in terms of percentage of obstructive sleep apnea, patients with lipid disorders, and patients with diabetes. Tell us about your primary treatment effect. Sure. So the primary endpoint was 24-hour um, average systolic blood pressure um, at 12 weeks. And what we saw was a placebo subtracted difference in the uh, blood runner stat 50 milligram arm of 7.9 millimeters of mercury. So from baseline, those, those individuals decreased by 15.4 millimeters of mercury, but the placebo group had a 7.4 millimeter mercury decrease. So just, just right around eight millimeter mercury decrease. What we saw in the Lorendra stat 50 to 100 milligram dose compared with placebo was, um, you know, similar baseline blood pressure reduction, right around 14 millimeters of mercury. So placebo adjusted was about six and a half millimeters of mercury reduction, both highly statistically significant. Right. So the 50 milligram dose appears to have done the trick. 
Uh, what were some of the secondary endpoints uh, with regards to those two doses? Yeah, so the, the one of the one of the key ones. There's a there's a number of key secondary endpoints that were um, uh, controlled for multiplicity. One of the ones that's important to note was was looking at control of systolic blood pressure. So 24 hour um, average systolic blood pressure less than 125 at week four. And so what we looked at was the placebo versus all the pooled lorendostat participants, and saw that um, 18% of placebo-treated participants got to that less than 125 at week four, whereas 41% of lorendrostat-treated participants um, got to goal, which is significant. You know, odds ratio was 3.3 in that perspective. Um, we looked at, you know, blood pressure reduction, um, you know, based on the number of uh, background antihypertensives, two versus three, we saw similar baseline blood pressure reductions, just between 11 and 12 millimeters of mercury for the um, patients on two versus three, and placebo subtracted in about the six millimeter mercury range for both the two and three drugs, um, drug groups, when you look at placebo subtracted numbers. Your secondary endpoints pool all of the uh, patients who received the intervention across dose ranges? The, the ones that are at the four week mark, because what we, what we, everyone received Lorendrostat 50 for the first four weeks. And then at that four week time period, based on uncontrolled blood pressure or, um, or biomarker changes, there was, um, you know, there was the potential to increase. There's one key secondary endpoint that looked simply at office systolic blood pressure reduction amongst those individuals that were escalated to the 100 milligram dose. And that was about 20% of that one trial group there. Um, and they saw from, from baseline a 17 and a half millimeter mercury decrease uh, from baseline and office systolic blood pressure. And what were the rates of hyperkalemia or any other safety events or adverse events? Yeah. So, I mean, all the safety signals were generally consistent with what one would expect from something that impacts the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So five of the participants, five out of 94 in the uh, Lorendrostat 50 milligram group um, had a serum potassium greater than 6.0 during the trial. Um, and that's how the SAP was written and that's how we report it. Um, important to note that three of those five actually had a repeat serum potassium within 72 hours while on the same dose and had normal potassium. So a little bit of factitious hyperkalemia probably in there as well. Um, however, in the Lorendrostat 50 to 100 milligram arm, there tended to be a little bit more hyperkalemia. It was seven of 94 patients. There also tended to be some hyponatremia. Um, now, most of that was actually probably driven by the thiazide type diuretic, particularly the use of endapamide, which is a stronger thiazide than, than hydrochlorothiazide or more potent um, in general, because 6% of placebo participants had hyponatremia. Um, and about 9% in the Lorendrostat 50 milligram arm had hyponatremia. Um, there was an expected decrease in, in GFR that we would expect. And as you know, you know, oftentimes signifying therapeutic benefit rather than harm in this scenario. But you know, placebo subtracted was about a 10% decrease in GFR throughout the trial that went back up once uh, the withdrawal period was over. How about hypotension or need to de-escalate other therapies? You did. We did see more hypotension um, in the Lorendrostat arms, um, and so there was the the need to de-escalate. You know, and as you know, in a trial like this, we end up de-escalating the Lorendrostat rather than the background therapies. But when you know when in this drug is ultimately um, you know approved, which you know, I assume it probably will be. Um, then, you know, then there'll be the question of, is one's hypertension driven by this aldosterone dysregulation phenotype? And then perhaps maybe then you, if someone's getting hypertensive, you have the dose of the ARB, for example, because, you know, 95% plus of these individuals were on 40 of Olmosartan, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and they also 95% plus were on the full dose of the thiazide type diuretic. Right. So this was a phase two trial and you didn't look at any clinical uh, endpoints. It wasn't an outcomes, particular outcomes trial. Uh, but beyond that, were there any other limitations you would like to discuss? 
Uh, I mean, I think that, um, you know, just with any type of blood pressure study, you're limited by the FDA for how long you can do it placebo controlled. Um, so that's 12 weeks. There's an open label extension trial that's going on with this drug further to get, you know, an idea of what longer treatment period is like. Um, it, of course, it was not tested against other antihypertensive therapies, so head to head. And that's the question that's always going to be asked. And I think it's an important one to ask is how would this compare to a plurinone or spironolactone? And, you know, hopefully those trials will be done in the future, not just with lorundrostat, but the other uh, aldosterone synthase inhibitors that are under investigation right now, Baxterstat and Vicadrostat. Right. So in your phase 2B trial, you demonstrated that lorendrostat, a dose of 50 milligrams, lowered 24-hour blood pressure in people who were optimized on background therapies and truly had resistant hypertension. What's your next plan of action beyond this presentation, aside from the publications? Any further work from your group? Yeah, so there's a, there's an ongoing phase three that actually has finished at this point, um, and the the press release is in the the public domain, but the actual manuscript isn't okay. But that's that's been completed, um, and then you know there's other smaller studies going on with Lorundrostat, looking at in participants with CKD in combination with an SGLT2 inhibitor, um, and then actually interestingly looking at obstructive sleep apnea as well. There's some thought that maybe aldosterone dysregulation is higher amongst those individuals. And and so could this be a therapy to lower blood pressure, but also, you know, help with some obstructive sleep apnea? So we'll see. But based on this study, which is one of its pivotal, and then its pivotal phase three, which I alluded to earlier, there's really enough efficacy data to go to regulatory agencies for approval. Um, there's just a little bit more safe, longer safety data from the open label extension. So, you know, hopefully, you know, patients may be able to have access to this and prescribers being able to, to use drugs like this, or at least consider using them. We'll have to have you back to talk about access costs and all of these other uh, payer-related uh, potential barriers. But um, for now, let me thank you and congratulate you on this trial and on your late-breaking presentation, Luke. So nice to meet you. Thanks. It's been wonderful to chat with you.